Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Zhong Yiho. Uh, thanks for joining this uh, design automation webinar. So this is the third event for, for our DOM. And, and uh, this is organized by SIGBA, uh, which is the organizer, uh, whose organizer is Ilan Chen, and I'm the representative from CETA. And uh, this topic will be uh, related to uh, secure silicon and talking about the recent developments and up challenges. So, so for this event, we have four uh, prominent speakers. Uh, they are uh, Brandon Wang from Synapsis and uh, Mark Teranipu from University of Florida and uh, Gang Ku from University of Maryland and uh, uh, Ma Reza Satehi from uh, TU Damshita. And, and this time we, we specially appoint the Professor Ye Jin as our moderator. He, I think everyone knows Ye, he's a, yeah, he's a hardware security expert. So I think it's good to, to have him to moderate this uh, event. So, so I will quickly go through the, uh, the, the, this slide. So, so first I will give a welcome remark and then the first speaker will be Brenton Wong. He will talk about the key to highway security. Yeah, and uh, Mark will talk about the automatic implementation of secure silicon, typically it's the overview for his uh, recent development for, for the ICE program. And, and third speaker, uh, Professor Gangku will talk about the assessment of highway security and trust. So first three speakers are related to the DAPA ICE program. And last but not least uh, are the, uh, is the uh, talk about the uh, enclave computing on risk five, a brighter future for platform security. So Ahmad, he will talk about his recent work on the secure, highway security on risk five. And also he will talk about uh, the recent development uh, from, from, his, from the perspective from Europe. So, so, each, so each talk, after each talk, it will be followed by the five minute. Hi Ahmad. Thank, thanks for joining us. Yeah, so each talk will follow by the five minute Q&A and uh, for, for each speaker at, at the end of the event, we will have a 15 minute for Q&A for all speakers. So now I want to do some advertisement. So now we have a two call for papers for journals. One is the uh, I3 Jet case. Yeah, it's a special issue for highway security. And another one will be the JETC. Uh, it's related to the trustworthy AI. So the last one will be the, we really know, I hope all partic participants will join the, the, member, uh, the membership of HM6 DA and the ISOPRO CDA. Yeah, so we really need you yeah, as a volunteer and also the experts uh, in uh, both communities. Okay, thank you. I think I, I, I want to leave more time for, 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 for the, the list of for excellent talk today. So now I will hand over the, the host to Professor Ye Jin. Okay, thanks. Thanks for joining the... Uh... Zongyi, can you keep the slides on? That that's, uh, that okay. looks very good. Oh, Brandon, can you just show your slides? So, uh... Sure, sure. Thanks. So it's a very high uh, profile uh, hardware security uh, panel. So I will keep my uh, introduction very short. Brandon uh, is the uh, vice president at Synops at Synopsis, and he is overseeing the strategic activities. So to be honest, I'm not quite understand what it means of strategic activities. Until recently, Brandon uh, kind of like guide uh, Synopsis going through the ACE program. That gave me an idea, a, a very vague idea what these strategic uh, activities uh, means. And uh, I look forward to the talk to Brandon to learn more about the strategic activities. All right, shall we start? Yes, Brandon, you have 20 minutes plus five minutes. Uh, okay, okay. Okay, I'm gonna zip through pretty quickly. Um, thank you everybody uh, for these opportunities. Uh, I will cover a little bit of high level on hardware security. And, uh, you know, we have expert Mark that we work together on the ACE together uh, again, and the rest of the expert will probably go deeper on the technical side. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, super. Yes. So uh, let me give a, a brief about Synopsis is about. Uh, Synopsis is from silicon to software. We cover um, 
you know, five area, software security quality, uh, verification covers leading semiconductor and system company to cut uh, design schedule by helping them verify uh, advanced silicon chip together with the software. The IP, uh, we have a large portfolio to enable customer to reduce the risk and spend time to market with the industry, probably the broadest uh, portfolio of high quality uh, silicon proven IP. Design group is really the core EDA that um, our digital custom analog mixed signal design tool to help customer achieve the, the best uh, result of productivity and, and optimize the power performance and area. The last one, Silicon Engineering Group, is our pioneer TCAD and lithography solution that used to uh, develop the next generation process and device modeling uh, for manufacturing. So now, that's why we see there's a, a growing market for semiconductor in three areas. One is the AI, the second is automotive, and the third one is IoT. So what are common in these three area? The common thing is that safety, security, and reliability are all needed, are much more needed in all these three growing segments. As you probably heard a story about the hackers, you know, get into the casino through the fish tank uh, a couple of years ago. And things could get worse in a car that's uh, the Wired magazine reported about three years ago. It's really dangerous because the hackers can actually infiltrate it by, you know, bypassing the whole, the, the anti-hacking shield of, of automotive. And the other example is a Ford magazine reported that this person have never get onto the airplane but be able to control from the ground. Okay, uh, by connected to a passenger on board. Okay, so these become a more serious things that the semiconductor industry really need to look at it. Not only the traditional security that covers network and software, but also go deeper to say, hey, we need to look at it. The chip level, the IP level, <clears throat> and all the sensors associated with the system. And that need the semiconductor engineer, semiconductor design engineer, design the hardware with the security in mind from the beginning. So as people in Silicon knows that our software is really look at optimized PPA, power, performance, and area. Now, we have added one dimension to that matrix, and that is to add security on it. So we need to optimize our design on power, area, speed, and security. And that is what PASS is about. You probably heard the PASS term in the ACE program announcement. So PASS is a evolution of semiconductor design matrix from PPA, power performance area, to power area speed and security. So let me give more detail on why we need to have this additional security on top of what we already done in a network and, and, and software security domain. Let's discuss some uh, common hardware hacking terminology. The first one came up is reverse engineering. One common way to reverse engineer is to do deep packaging of parts and examine it. See the picture on the screen is a, a picture taken in those good old days that you can actually plot out the whole layout 
and put on the floor. That's like 20 years ago. And a reverse engineering will go there and check every layer of, of, of the metal and then reverse the schematic and then re-enter into the schematic editor. And this is done in the micron, one or two micron technology. Of course, now this is much more complicated as we move to advanced nodes. But there are other ways to uh, hack the hardware system, such as side channel attack. <clears throat> so side channel attack aimed at extract security attract secret from the chip or the system through the measurement of analysis of physical parameters. The example of such a parameter including supply current, execution time, electronic man magnetic emission, power analysis, consider the power consumptions when you're processing, when the chip is running, and look at the waveform data and computation steps to extract information. For example, this is a ISA crypto phase for different operations that can be distinguished by looking at the, uh, the power consumption. And you see the left peak shows the power consumption during a squaring only steps and the right one peaks showing the uh, operation multiplication uh, steps that allows exponents bits zero and one to be distinguished through reading the power um, curve. And that can be used to sabotage, espionage, and other purpose. Also, malicious hardware is um, sometimes referred as a Howard Trojan. This malicious modification of the circuitry of, of IC or electronic system increases the need to be careful when, uh, when you purchase equipment from a non repeatable source that could have been placed hardware trojan inside the chip or the system to leak the keyboard uh, password or provide remote unthor unauthorized access. So it's very difficult to confirm um, but the, the May 2008 IEEE Spectrum magazine had an article described military radar failure due to the back door that was hidden in a regular commercial processors. A supply chain attack seeks to uh, damage an organizing, uh, organization by targeting a less secure element in the whole supply chain network. A supply chain attack can occur in any, uh, any industry, not just you know, our semiconductor. But for us, it is anywhere from manufacturing the chip to packaging, to assembly, and even to distribution. And that usually provides a lot of economic gain for the attackers by having an edge against the competitors. Here's an example, you know, a various attack can happen in a typical semiconductor supply chain. IP theft can happen early in the development life cycle. Reverse engineering, probably after we think the IP has been safeguarded, right? And finally, the whole lack of security measure can lead into financial losses and even sabotage the whole you know, system. So here's a few more headlines showing the breadth of the hacker's landscape. You know, medical record, personal data, law enforcement target, focus on economic gain. Um, you know, a few examples of how much one security vulnerability can cost you over $8 million, you know, loss of trust, if not counted. So that is really, why there are hardware hacks and why we need to come up with a solution 
that what we call the zero trust security model. Let's really think about the way that we design product today, you know, over the internet, using the internet, um, using external human resources in many countries around the world. It is hard to vet all aspects of your development process. So when security is at the utmost importance, we rely on, we must establish a framework uh, and showing here because zero trust model, which is to say trust no one, both inside and outside of the network, use visibility, analytics, and automation to monitor assets and to keep the police policies in check. Remember, we, we, we're trying to uh, prevent uh, cloning, you know, overbuilt parts, recycling, and we want to prevent or at least detect the unauthorized insertion post design. We also want to prevent and detect corruption inside the building back, uh, the back doors and side channels, as we described, to leak information after shipping. The ideal situation is that if the supply chain can be completely untrusted without compromising trustworthiness of a chip produced. And let's look at, take this model and look at the, you know, SOC. By the way, here is uh, showing the, um, the DARPA ACE program. Uh, so we started like almost a year ago and look at the, you know, the area. We, we, we are very proud, Synopsys is very proud to take, take a leadership roles in the security by working with all the players. Let's see, listen on the screen. And today Marco do more uh, dive on technical side of the ACE program. Um, Really, uh, if you look at the high level, the security goal we try to achieve is to enable the creation of a threat resistant design that's configurable with a different security level and it's very easy to implement with the regular commercial tool. Have comprehensive coverage on formal analysis, IPs, and flows with high level degree of automation. You know, threat resistant design really is talk about IP SOC protection against reverse engineering site channel attack, templating and other insecure supply chain that we just discussed. The configurable security level is really try to set out the protection based on the level of security so that we have a good trade-off against power, performance, and area. Ease of use is really to take the commercial tool flow and on top of it, augment it with secure IP repository and some plugins so that design engineer does not learn a completely new set uh, for security purpose. And then, and then the comprehensiveness is really talk about the coverage on formal leakage analysis, security IP portfolio, including root of trust, you know, crypto. I'm gonna go a little bit deeper uh, on, on this, you know, fault injection on this uh, in, in my next uh, couple of slides. So really we have to, you know, be innovate in the security engine security SOC generator and cost analysis together optimized with power area speed, the regular parameters we use to do IC design. And with that, that we can impact the multi-dimensional cost function in our automation and optimization. And here is, um, you know, a typical silicon. Of course, it's a simplified one with CPUs, GPUs, a system bus, and some sort of memory. So if you have that system, usually means the SOC the subsystem 
is completely trusted. You trust it that SLC interconnect fabrics, the bus, serve the role of all the trust, trusted network inside this whole package. That's what we usually do. But with ACE, what we like to do is that SOC need to incorporate rule of trust and secure enclaved subsystem. So you're basically not trusting the CPU to authenticate the bootstrap process by itself. So sub-modules, entities are assessed and access control before enable the full, you know, the fulfill of the primary end user's uh, function. So with the ACE program initiative from DARPA, the new access of the security is added into optimization target. And that is, is PASS matrix is all about. And furthermore, on top of the root of trust functionality, we can layer on a security bootstrap and a storage and cryptographic key. So you have a secure debug and test access and the ability to perform a secure update to software and firmware. Now you added runtime access control policy, detection of the aberrant behavior, measurement, attestation of subsistence state, and now you'll really be able to detect a hack. So incorporate the measures to enable SOC capability and provide that identification and authentication. Now the device can have limit access uh, to only certify clients. And more than that, we add a firewall allows the static and dynamic policy limits on the subsystem connectivity with the SOC, as you see along the bus. This control, including such as IA, uh, IO access filters to limit the subsystem communications, uh, attaining certain operation states, you know, MPUs, MMUs, IO MMUs can provide limits on access to memory address range and, uh, and multi-range uh, encryption, authentication of external and shared memory provide one additional layer of security. So the ability to monitor behaviors like power level, reset event, bus traffic can further augment the security in a zero trust environment. Furthermore, we add analytics to the mix and now you can detect a device that is compromised or fully off the reel. So really with all these newly added element, we need a set of tool and infrastructure to go together and work for this you know, mutual benefit of this product. And then that tool has to be started at the lowest level when the design process started. And that is design for security solution. So we look at the aspect, logic locking, which locks the circuit enabled by a key, but does not necessarily hide the structure of the design. So people can see the structure. You know, it might split the design into, uh, to, to, to prevent the complete functionality until the key is provided. Now the logic obfuscation will hide the structure of the circuit. It does increase the difficulty of certain kind of attack, but does not necessarily defeat it, the attack. Logic encryption is a combination of both logic obfuscation and locking. So by combining, you prevent the chips from the functional correctness without a proper description key. So it's, so it's one layer more secure. And watermarking is Latin circuitry that can be remotely triggered to produce a, a device authenticator, you know, such as sending a, uh, a special string of bits would produce the, the, the watermark, which could then be used to validate the provenance. So give a quick example. This is a uh, historically 
how you integrate the DFT structure without really thinking about security. But as you see that, the DFT is where the hackers can use the scan chain to hack. So that nowadays the DFT, we, we had a uh, compression insertion, right? A, de a, a, a big decomposer on the front end is fed by a few scan input. And then the back end had a compactor which feeds a few scan out. The input of this kind of codec is typically either MOX or XORs and the output is usually XOR gates. And this gives the, some sort of amount of actual protection. But still, the hackers can glean information even with le that level of um, obfuscation. So logic-based use a compression scheme that leverage LFSSRs for the scan data input based on you know, the seeds and the MISRs at the back end. So this is further uh, increase the level of protection, but still not enough. So now because your core need to connect it into the DFT fabric, which flow the core to core, die to die, even you know, finally come out to a, a global access point, such as here, a, a high bandwidth access point uh, to the testers. And that give the full access for the entire spectrum of threats and the back actors outside of your chip have you know, a chance to get into all secrets inside your package. So more protection is really needed. In the ACE program, we have more details to talk about how these protections inserted, such as, you know, Give one example here. As you see that with enhancement and the DFTs, that you can increase another level of diagnosing the detect, the hack, the hackers. Hey Brandon, so uh, I need you to conclude your talk in one minute. Okay, I'll skip this. Uh, this. Uh, Obfuscation locking and uh, optimizing. So what I try to show here is on top is the, really the RTL to GDS2 design flow, right? So with the ACE program, we'll be able to insert security implementation within the tool. So the designer does not need to uh, be the security expert in, in order to do a secure silicon design. And that itself, is more secure method because now you don't have to be exposed the security method to an average designer. So that is where the, uh, the ACE, the automation added the value to security. And that including also the, um, the coverage, design coverage. And finally, the test. The test you see here is that the silicon, how the silicon when it connect to the tester need to be secured. So with this, I will introduce the uh, uh, synopsis have the silicon lifecycle management platform, okay, which is ultimately on top of ACE. It is a broader uh, way to look at how that you can be cover the entire life cycle of the parts from security reliability and safety point of view. And this is exactly the premise that behind the, the, this, the Synopsis Silicon Life Management Platform. Because we cannot just stop in a security design, it will extend it, the whole thing, to monitor the health of the system or silicon across all phase of, of life cycle from manufacturing even to the infill operation. 
They are optimization opportunity for all phase of the cyclic life cycle and capitalizing on this opportunity to require some tight feedback loops between the chip in instrument and the cloud-based data analytical. You will definitely see more coming through the use of this embedded monitor and sensor, the intelligence embedded throughout the entire chip, the data analytical added, this really um, will give specifically on-chip security, you know, this critical um, element to ensure that you have authorized access to the data and a target analytical to enhance the security, security measurement and ultimately enable the pre um, emptive actions. As shown here, this is using the data to find a, a normalistic device behavior, such as you know, some sort of high frequency reset, unexpected current variation, uh, all these things that now suddenly with the, with the data that you can, with the analytical capability, can further increase the, uh, the, sec the secure level. And for that, you'll see that in this five area, the synopsis has been, this is running, that all of them have security initiatives, right? From software, verification, IP, design, and silicon. And each of the individual components and subsystem designed to work together so that we can create a scalable security engine in the, in the middle of the SOC. And we have a programmable root of trust component to implement policy, core security function like system secure boots, you know, secure storage and key manage management. We have uh, protocol aware, crypto, uh, interface encryptions, and we will support all the firmwares for root of trust and host. And then we will you know, give an example in this security IPs like critical blocks, security engines that will have the formal analysis to look at the data path leakage and data integrity. Uh, the other aspect is attacker may attempt to derive secret keys used in the encryption by injection like a, a fault that can introduce temporarily malfunction during the device operation. So our device needs to be resilient to such a, a fault attack. So as you see on the screen that, that we have fault simulation engine, right? Uh, for such a malicious uh, fault and be able to handle this attack by model using this you know, uh, the fault simulator as part of your design and verification process. So with that, I complete the whole picture of the six topics I like to cover from silicon to software. You know, we, we had really building a comprehensive security portfolios from, from silicon to software not only limited to the hardware securities. So really Synopsys has really the security initiative uh, as a strategic initiative within Synopsys. And we definitely like to work with uh, you know, our customer, our partners, and also the academia uh, to together to make, it, to make it successful. And before I close, the, I would like to mention that Synopsys is um, very proud to be closely connected to the academic community. Uh, and IEEE, right? So we sponsored an um, academic event. Uh, recently, we, you know, ICCAT, ACM, uh, and recently we just sponsored the uh, CASE COVID-19 uh, student design competition. But more importantly, we uh, really um, partner with the, with the research communities um, I call the research collaboration uh, with the uh, leading academic researchers, professors, research institute scientists, and that partnership will it's very important for us to look at uh, strategic initiatives such as securities as we discussed here today.
<laughs> thanks, so, thanks, Brandon. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very nice talk. When Brandon first introduced the PASS metric, I thought that's all about the talk. And then later I realized it's only one of the six topics he would cover. Very, very much information. So um, given that we are kind of running a bit late, I would suggest people ask a question through the Q&A session. Uh, Brenda, I think you are still with us until the end of the panel. We have another uh, 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 centralized uh, uh, Q&A session at that time. So uh, please sure. feel free to ask a question during the Q&A session. Uh, uh, and also you uh, type in your question so that I hope Brandon can answer those questions. Uh, okay, so, and our third speaker uh, is Gang Ku. So Gang Ku is one of the uh, dedicated hardware security educator. Uh, many of you may take his MOOC course uh, online. So uh, including my, myself, I really appreciate his effort in promoting hardware security uh, through this educational part. Uh, Gang Ku, can you share your slides? Yes. Okay. So uh, again, in order to stick our schedule, I would uh, ask you to kind of conclude that in 20, 20, 20 minutes. Yes, thank you. Okay, so I'm scheduled to finish at 11.26, okay? Okay, that'd be great. <laughs> and first, I mean, thanks uh, IEEE uh, CIDA and ACM CDA, thank Ira and uh, uh, Zhongyi to, I mean, give this opportunity. So for us to talk with uh, the audience, with, I mean, people, friends all over the world about this, uh, uh, this effort we're, we're, I mean, we're having now, okay? So I give this title assessment of hardware security and the trust. That is because when Yi and, uh, 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 and Zhongyi contact me, they, are, they want me to introduce about our, our role in the Dapper ACE program. So uh, as I was, I mean, talking to, I mean, very next, I mean, a couple of slides and our role is in some sense the assessment. So that is why I give this title. And then that is also something, I mean, I'm, I mean, just started learning. And I also, I thank, I mean, Brandon and Mark to give, I mean, some in, nice introduction about the ACE, Dapper ACE program. So I can probably, I mean, really fast forward the first couple of slides. So this is a slide I got from Sergi and uh, Serge Leaf, who is the program manager for the Dapper uh, ACE program. And the, the goal of the program is trying to automate inclusion of the scalable defense mechanisms into chip designs to enable security versus economics optimizations. And I think, I mean, both Brandon and, uh, and Mark has, I mean, they have stated this one very, very clearly. So it is about the auto automation in uh, automated implementation of, of security for, for silicons. And this is a, another slide from DAPA's program where they mentioned about the two technical areas, which I think Mark mentioned about TA1. So let me try this. So they separate the TA1 here and the TA1 here. So this is more or less about, I mean, the current research, research with the existing research about all the uh, hardware security and trust features. And this one talks about the more or less the, 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 uh, the, the implementation part. And uh, the, the TA2 here is focused on the integration. So the basic idea about here is they focus on these two words, uh, AI, which is not artificial intelligence. It is the, it is the one we call, I mean, automated uh, implementation. So the key here is, I, I think, I mean, the message also you get it clearly from Brandon and Mark is, it's not trying to develop a lot of new techniques. It is about trying to commercialize or trying to in some sense implement the existing research from the research community in the past, I mean, two decades. And these are the four specific, I mean, focus areas, which I think I mean, Mark has uh, showed it a couple of times. There are side channels, reverse engineering, supply chain, and malicious hardware. And the DAPA actually, I mean, they have uh, two teams working on this project. 
And the first project is, uh, the first team is the team Synopsis, led by Synopsis with uh, a couple of uh, other companies, Boeing and Artrosonic, which are the two leading, I mean, IP uh, providers. And also there are uh, a University of Florida, uh, Mark and his uh, friends, and Texas A&M, University of California, San Diego. So three universities are involved. And the other team is uh, led by this company called Northrop Grumman. And they have IBM, University of Arkansas, and the University of Florida involved. And they are only working on TA1. And so then what is the, the role of our team here in University of Maryland? So we was approached by DAPA earlier this year, and then they formed this team called IVNV team. And the key purpose for us is to do the assessment. And our team mainly focus uh, uh, consists of researchers from Maryland and uh, uh, NYU, the New York University. And this Frank Hoff is an institution that is a German owned I mean, research institution, which is located in College Park, in University of Maryland. And these people are also in some sense, either uh, our faculty members were affi affiliated with us. So to be more specific, so what we do in the DAPA uh, ACE program, so basically, I mean, this is the scope, which is, I mean, I got the slides from the, uh, the, the, the kickoff kick meeting of the DAPA ACE program. So what we do is we do the assessment and this you have this uh, seven bullets here. So the last four are the four technical areas. So these are talking about more on the system integration part. And it is, so ideally the ACE program is going to provide an automated chip design and implementation pl platform, which will be available on the cloud. So people can use that uh, automation platform to do the design. And what is new in, in that the, uh, platform is security will be integrated as another design matrix, together with uh, chip area, with the power, with the speed, with all manufacturer abilities, with, with the test abilities, with all the traditional design objectives. And I'm not going to read all the details about, in particular, these four technical areas, because I mean, Mark and Brandon, they have done a really great job in explaining these four areas. So what I'll do is I'll try to, I mean, use the next, I mean, uh, 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 12, 30 minutes to give you s some sense about what we're going to do, or well, in some sense, what do we mean by hardware security and trust? And uh, given the time I have, I probably will focus on this one small example, which is people, I mean, talk about the finite state machine model. So, so this is a, a small question that most of people, when we do the, do the digital design 101, we, we know that. So we're going to design a system that is going to implement, which talk, sometimes people call the, 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 the pattern generator or the pattern, I mean, recognizer. So you are going to recognize in some sense, I mean, for example, five letters with a, a pattern of five objects. And then they, they can be represented in this case, for example, zero, one, three, five, seven. And this pattern will show up repeatedly one after another. And this is uh, represented by this thing, which people call the finite state machine, where you have five states, zero, state one, state three, uh, state five, and street step, and then you go back to zero. And this is another representation of the state machine, which is the one we call, I mean, the, the state transition table. So these are the, the states, these are the flip-flops that we implement each of the states. And this will be the their next states when you do the transition. And when we do the typical design, I'm going to, I mean, skip all these things here and then show you the design here, okay? So this is the design eventually we have where we implement this using three T flip-flops. So the flip-flop A, flip-flop B, flip-flop C, okay? And this is in some sense, I mean, for, for regular, I mean, undergraduate students who are taking the digital logical design course. So this is in some sense, this will be the perfect answer here. So the system here does provide you this functionality here. So it gives you this repeated pattern of zero, one, three, five, seven, and then go back to zero, and then keep on repeating there forever, okay? And for people who are doing testing, we know that for this design, there's another very important aspect you have to test, you have to check. And that is something people call self-correcting. So what is the meaning of self-correcting? So let's go back here. You see, okay, so if the system with these three flip-flops, A, B, C, 
And I'm implementing these seven states, zero, one, three, five, and seven. But there are three other states, two, four, and six. They're not specified here. So in my design, I don't really care about, I mean, what will be the content for the flip flops during that time, what will be their, their, ne their next states, the transitions. However, now I have this true implementation here, the hard piece, the physical system here. So I'm going to take a look and then I'm going to check what happens if, for example, at state zero, one, zero, when the input here, when the data here is zero, data here is one, data is here. As I'm going to like the clock run one clock cycle, as I'm going to come back and check what is the content for these three flip flops. So let these people talk about, I mean, you check whether this thing is self-correcting. So if for some reason you run into this un, uh, unexpected state, so what will be the next stage? So this is in some sense when we get out and then when we do the, to figure out all the flip flop content, and then we try to figure out what is the next stage, okay? So in this example, state from state two, it will move to state five. Because for example, the first bit A, it is going to be toggled because this is one. So it changes from zero to one. And so now, now let's come back to the finite state machine level. So this is the initial state machine we are supposed to implement. And after I done this circuit analysis, I know for that for the other three states that are not specified here, I know what will be their next state. So I'm going to add this to the finite state machine, okay? So now I have a complete finite state machine with all the eight states. And for each of these three unwanted states, their next move will go back to this circle, which in that se uh, sense, we are saying this circuit is self-correcting, which means that if for whatever reason you come up with the wrong state, with a unspecified state, just let the clock run one cycle and then you come back to the, to the red track. So this is a very good design. And so, so what happens now is we see, okay, so we are done this and this is probably, I mean, for some advanced dig digitological course, you can tell the students to do a self-correcting. And how does this connect it to security and the trust? So what I have here is I have this uh, original one, that's the, uh, the state machine with eight states. And somehow if I do the test and I come up with a different design, and if this is what happens with the three unspecified states. And in this case, you see, I mean, if you come to six, next time you go to four, and the next time you go to two, and then next clock cycle you come to four, and then you're going to remain here as a loop. So this is not self-correcting. So the design is not well-defined, the design here. So these are the things that in the traditional design we are trying to avoid. But now with one of the features, for example, Mark mentioned about, I mean, the, the watermark. So now if I do the circuit, I mean, if I try to uh, test the circuit, I check the finite state machine, and I come up with this state machine here. And I say, okay, I still have this pattern here, which does the four state transition here. And for each of these three unwanted states, they move into the circle. So they are self-correcting, and which in some sense, it is a good de design. This again, it is the same, it is a good design because eventually they all move back to the circle. And however, what we talk about the security here is, for example, in, uh, in, the, in the ACE program, that one mark when their team decided to add a watermark based on whatever their mechanism and eventually come up with this. So then the thing here is, I mean, I should be able to verify that, okay, in some sense, they designed this transition, this transition, not just uh, randomly. In some sense, they want this transition to happen in some sense to, re to reflect their watermark. So that is in some sense one of the uh, objectives for us to do the ass assessment. And I'll give you another example here. So again, I mean, I have finite state machines. So now I have two state machines here. So the first one here, it has three states, zero, 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 one, and one, zero. The second one here, it has four states. And I ask you a very simple question. Are these two finite states machines the same? So, so of course this problem is probably not well defined. So what do you mean by the same? So of course, if you take a look and they look different because this one has three states and state machine two has four states and you can see, okay, so they're they different. And how about if I say, okay, so 
I ask, are they functionally equivalent? So this is for most of the graduate level logical synthesis course, they are going to discuss this. And to, to check whether two state machines, they are, log they are functional equivalent, you have a formal method, which is called product machine. And then if you build a product machine, you can indeed verify that indeed these two state machines, they are equivalent. Assume that this is our initial state, this is also the initial state. And you see in the state machine two and all the dark edges, the black edges, they're the same as the state machine one. And the red edges, they're they are the new edges, okay? Okay, so as a matter of fact, so how do we reach, I mean, the second state machine? So that is why I start from the state machine one and I do the traditional system design and then I eventually come up with this uh, digital circuit. And then why do the uh, uh, finite state machine uh, a representation of this circuit with a full circuit analysis, I come up with this one here, okay? So that is basically shows I have a correct design. And then if you use the state, uh, use the product machine to verify this, they are the same. But what are the security concerns here? What are the trust concerns here? So imagine this is your initial st state. This is also the initial state. So if you take a look at the original state, the state machine. So once you leave here, you can never come back to restart. There's no incoming edges to this state. So you cannot come back. So restart is not an option for this, for this system. But in this case, you say, okay, state zero, zero, which is my initial state. I can go to the restart state from any of the other states. Then from that, pers uh, from that aspect, so these two states are different. And this one has this additional feature that you can go back, you can restart. And if you want to think about the security, if this is the state that people want to have access control, so people cannot come to here, but in this design, everybody has the, the permission to go there. So that is not good. And so hopefully, I mean, what I'm trying to convince you from this slide is, so there are a lot of things you need to test, you need to assess, you need to verify beyond the traditional design objectives when you talk about hardware security and the trust of features. In particular, as the ACE, ACE project they are going to do is, they are going to embed or implement the existing security, I mean, hardware security uh, algorithms or pr uh, approaches, which we have developed in the past 20 years into the, into the I mean, the EDA tools. So, so I'm going to quickly, I mean, show to, uh, a couple of other examples. So this is a digital watermark example where in, we implement the, the DES, that is, I mean, more, this is more than 20 years ago and on the FPGA board. And this is the one without watermark. This is the one with watermark. And visually you can see some difference, but the things here, I mean, this is how can you, I mean, develop a tool in some sense to a formal assessment to show that your watermark is indeed there, is indeed robust. And this is another example here, which we shows this concept called a fingerprint. So if I, for example, at the gate level of, this, of the IP of the circuit, I see these two things here. And I'm going to see, okay, so they look different, but I mean the things, but if you do an analysis, they have the same functionality. And then why we are doing that? And then you, ha you, ha you have to make sure that when you do the, uh, do the, optimi the, do the design, the optimization tools is not going to, in some sense, remove this one, okay? Because they have, this one has been put it here for a purpose, which is trying to embed your fingerprint. And the last example I'm going to have here is, so we talk about the logical obfuscation with, uh, uh, where you have, the, I mean, the, the designs that looks different where in some sense it's hard for any reverse engineering attackers to, to analyze. So what I have here is I have some, I mean, transistor level, I mean, logical gates, and it is not clear to us what these are. Uh, but if you go to um, a edge spice sim simulation, you probably can see, okay, so what will be the input output, I mean, the truth table. And then you can conclude what are the, uh, the functionalities. And indeed, these are the something we call, I mean, polymorphic gates, which means that the gate will behave differently if you change the operating uh, environment, for example, the temperature or the voltage. And in this case, we change the voltage. And with different voltage, this logical gate can be either an exclusive OR gate or can be a NAND gate. And similarly, this one can either be a NAND gate or can be a NOR gate. So this increases the difficulty for people to do tests, to do verification, to do, I mean, to do assessment. So if for some reason 
they decided to use polymorphic gate to do the logical obfuscation. And then we have to, in some sense, at this level, we have to go to the circuit to verify this, to show this, and also in, more important, to show that how can you use this to obfuscate the, the, the design. And finally, so let me conclude here. So what we have here is, so our, for our team, our goal is trying to do the assessment for hardware security and the features that has been embedded into the ACE program to the aut automatic implementation. And what to assess, and so this most important is trying to uh, test the security and the trust features they have claimed, and also try to t evaluate the trade-off in the traditional design objectives, like the, the power, the timing, the, the, the size, the, the chip area. And how do we do the assessment? And these are the things that I, I, I mean, in the earlier slides, they, they have uh, more details. So of course, I mean, there should be a formal analysis, which because I mentioned in the ACE program, it focuses on automation and implementation. So most of these features, they have been, uh, these algorithms, they have been published before. So for, each, for all those papers, they do have analysis, security analysis. And in our approach, we are going to focus on this. So we are going to use the platform that's de delivered by the two ACE teams, and then try to do some designs to simulate the design, and then try to launch certain attacks, and then trying to evaluate whether the design becomes more secure, more robust against the attacks. And finally, that is something, I mean, it is, I call it beyond assessment. So the goal here is not for us to check, I mean, whether the two teams are, the teams are doing a good job or not. That is one thing, but the more important, we're trying to find out whether there's new vulnerabilities. And then indeed, the ultimate goal is trying to improve the security and automation of this I mean, ACE program. And when I talk about the finding new uh, the unknowns, we're talking about, I mean, in the design, so whether there's any unknown, for example, vulnerabilities, which people have not identified before. Whether in these uh, countermeasures that the two ACE teams, they have decided to implement in their I mean, platform, whether this will introduce any new uh, attacking surface. And also in the implementation and in the automation process, this is probably the part that can, you can have a lot of new vulnerabilities. For example, we know, I mean, Mark mentioned about the power, and, uh, power analysis. That is come from the, the I mean, the non, not secure implementation of the modular exponentiations. And to conclude here, so I put, I mean, the ACE logo here back again. So we know that as it test, it is hard, although I'm not a person doing tests, I'm slowly learning it. And, but, but most of the traditional test objectives, they are well-defined. And for hardware security and the trust, which have been working for many years. So we have a lot of, I mean, when I say we, I, I talk about a community, not our own group. So there are a lot of research results going on in the past two or three decades. But again, there are still a lot of more unknowns here. And the ACE program, we have two teams. And the goal here is trying to, in some sense, commercialize this, all this research uh, result in the past two decades to product. And finally, I talk about our assessment. How do, we, how do people assess or test the security features? And I talk about, I mean, our role here as the DAPAR's ACE team, IV and V. And thank you very much. And I think I'm a little bit, I think, two minutes yeah, over. Uh, thanks, Gang. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, as I mentioned, you're a good educator. Even though I know the, 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 the concept is still a very good uh, memory refresh to, <laughs> to better understand the FSM technique. So uh, again, as I said, uh, uh, thanks for the, the presentation. We will keep all the uh, questions at the end uh, so that we can keep uh, stick to our schedule. Uh, the first, uh, the last but not least, uh, Ahmad. Ahmad, he is a... Uh, cybersecurity experts. So, but recently he seems decided to work on hardware security. Well, we are all wondering what he would do uh, to hardware security. He organized the hack and deck and hack and sec competition, which really like raised a lot of noise in hardware security area. I think even recently DAPA has a program called FETT is following this style, slightly different background. So, Amanda, we look forward to your talk introducing us more about the hack deck, hack deck, or something similar. Oh, do you do you hear me? Yes, but can you share your but, slide? But uh, no, because uh, okay, I share. Yeah. 
let me see if it's the right let me see if it's the right one oh, i hope it's the right one let me see ah oh, yes i think so we can see the slides oh that's beautiful okay so so now i have to somehow uh, yeah so do you see now this slide yes yes yeah. Okay, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. Um, maybe some remarks to your introduction. First of all, I am not a member of uh, ISIS or ACES, how you call it, I don't know. Um, it seems to be a very interesting project, but uh, uh, typically uh, German universities are, are not uh, uh, funded by, by DARPA. So it's, it's independent of that project, but I think that project has a number of interesting, um, as far as I uh, understood it, a number of uh, interesting parallels to the projects that we are doing in uh, at our university, but also with other colleagues uh, in Asia and in in US. The second thing is, I'm not doing for for uh, just since 2018 uh, hardware security. I'm doing that for more than 20 years in embedded security. So, I think that is uh, <laughs> clear from our publications. Yeah. Just, a small, just a small correction for the next time you introduce me. Um, and uh, since you talked about uh, Hacker DAC, I would like to um, first, before I start about uh, enclave computing on, on RISC V and, and, and security containers that most of you may know or may not know, uh, maybe I just uh, uh, start with um, something that I call the insecurity of security architectures or the meat of uh, uh, trust anchors. So um, we always talk about trust anchors in hardware and for many years, uh, many security experts, uh, including myself, when we write papers, I mean, Yair knows that we always talk about, okay, we can uh, trust hardware and we consider many uh, aspects of physical access out of scope. So we are not talking about physical access, no, uh, electromagnetic waves or no, uh, uh, um, so to say, hardware oriented uh, uh, side channel uh, attacks. I'm talking about you have no hardware access and, about, uh, and you just launch an attack remotely. So one idea, uh, one, uh, so to say, uh, aspect on why we can't really trust on trust anchors uh, and how do we, should we make these trust anchors? Because it is always a relative uh, aspect. This was a problem that uh, attracted myself, my team, and also a number of other colleagues that maybe I can name them uh, here during the talk. So as uh, was mentioned by, by other speakers, especially the first speaker, I think Brandon uh, from uh, Synapses mentioned several times side channel attacks both in hardware and what we call software side channel attacks. Um, and there is, of course, a religious uh, debate in, in, among scientists, what is actually hardware si uh, side channel, what is software, everything is side channel attacks, or everything is hardware based side, side channel attacks, but we don't go there. So as you can see on this slide, uh, there is a big buzz and uh, a big hype on microarchitecture or hardware based attacks, where uh, I just, just put some of the most recent uh, attacks from Spectre, Meltdown, uh, CLK Screw, TL Bleed, uh, Foreshadow. As you see, all these attacks, they have to do with microarchitectural attacks. That means mostly it's about transient executions, mostly it's about all the performance aspects that were designed in, in the hardware, but unfortunately, any meet intermediate computation is visible to software. So I'm talking about the so-called, as we call it, cross-layer exploits. That means you can remotely exploit uh, a system by exploiting by, or by knowing the hardware vulnerability. So you use software, unprivileged software, to really uh, attack a system by knowing hardware vulnerabilities. So, but, our question was, as you see, there are a number of nice names here. So the title of this probably like Zombie Land and Spoiler. And, but many of these names are much more creative than the content of those papers. 
So that means um, I'm just not of offending any means. Every, every of them is interesting, but they are all the same. So the question is, is there anything else in, in the wild that we need to look for it? Because that was not very, that was a bit embarrassing for all, uh, all uh, you know, big companies, semiconductors to have this problem in their process of because of closed source aspects. So this is where uh, we found out, okay, all these patching aspects were not helpful. So we started with Hackadack that I just want to make a kind of commercial here for it. It uh, indeed started uh, very, very small with a poster session at DAC. And now we are kind of uh, extremely popular. And until now, more, more than 160 teams, each team at least four to five people. So several hundred t uh, people were trying to um, find the vulnerabilities or design flaws that we fabricated into the chips or SOCs in general, together with Intel. So here, Intel has really uh, provided us with many, many insights that usually is under NDA. And uh, because it is in their uh, advantage, you get uh, uh, free labor. I mean, all the smart people all over the world are trying to hack in your system and you don't even have to pay them. So that is a very good thing for Intel, but also for those uh, groups who are, uh, are fine. So it was so popular that even Usenix Security this year asked us to do it uh, at Usenix as well. So we had really double uh, uh, of effort on Usenix and, and hack, uh, hack attack. So if you're interested, contact me. I can give you lots of information. We are publishing more and more uh, information about this. And also we are going to put it in the Amazon to make a hack at DAC or hack at SEC uh, 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 as a service. Okay, so I just uh, don't go through all the things. What is important here that there were uh, deep dive uh, uh, bugs in the hardware, but the interesting point is that, that these uh, vulnerabilities can be exploited by software. So they are cross layer attacks. So they will go beyond microarchitectural attacks deep in the hardware. So I'm just uh, reporting from HackerDAC 2018 and 19, just go very fast through it. Uh, we use a lot of CVEs that were existing to, to fabricate uh, the box. And we used also bugs that were internally found by Intel or they were never published. And some of them were revealed to us to put into this SOC. So there are lots of insight if you participate. We use RISC-V as a platform because Intel was outside. Intel would not give us the opcode, uh, as you know. And uh, we did a systematic analysis that the bugs were, were, the bugs were really systematically designed. So from boot ROM to memory bus, from cryptographic engines to peripheral registers and so on. So, and we considered four uh, uh, aspects, denial of service, privilege escalation, software exploitation, and uh, uh, leakage of information. So these were uh, the classes, uh, classes of attacks that people could uh, uh, use. So this is a list of one of the first uh, bugs that does over um, uh, 30 uh, bugs. But what is interesting is that some of the teams, they could find uh, bugs and they could find design vulnerabilities that we did not put in the open source uh, RISC-V platform. That means they, they were native platform uh, vulnerabilities that we didn't fabricate. So that's also one of the side uh, results of this uh, inclusion. So now I come back to the thing and make it fast uh, because we have only 20 minutes and it's soon gone. Back to the main story and that's enclave computing. What is enclave computing? Most of you know that. We have a, a abstract view of the system here. Um, you have operating system, you have uh, your applications, but you, want, you would like to have hardware supported, isolated, uh, trusted execution environment where, which is called enclaves, and you can run your app securely. So this is the idea of enclave. The industry solutions, Intel SGX is one of the most sophisticated ones. Then we have uh, AMD's SEV and ARM's Trust Zone, which is already in almost 20 years old. So, and they provide some kind of trust execution environment, some kind of enclave. And we have seen that they were target, massively target of, uh, as, uh, of, of side channel attacks mostly based on shared resources like cached based side channel attacks. And we can today say that SGX, although side channel attacks was outside the scope of SGX, SGX has been massively attacked and I don't know how they 
can come out with it without really uh, very, very uh, um, high, uh, or let's say low, per, low performance or high load of patching and every, everything uh, must be, you know, uh, uh, repaired again and again instead of having a fundamental solution. So, uh, but solutions are all requiring hardware modification. And uh, risk five concept, although it is an open source, an open source doesn't mean security. It means that it is more more eyes can be on it if those eyes are there. So for enclave comp uh, computing, I think one of the future directions would be uh, risk five. So let us see what are what is on the market. I am just going to select some of the works which are well uh, mostly cited in this area for security architectures, or as I call it, enclave computing on top of risk five. So, uh, just to have an isolated uh, environment that is uh, not prone to a variety of side channel attacks. I will come to that later. So, this is again your architecture. You have your caches, L1, L2. You can see it here if you uh, look at this, the system bus. You have your applications, then user level and uh, super, uh, supervisor level, as, it, as you know, in, for every system. And in uh, Sanctum, which is a, a, a proposal a security architecture by, by MIT, um, you have the so-called user level enclaves. So as you see, it's like a user app, user, user space app running on top of the operating system. So an OS manages uh, um, enclave. Um, there is a security monitor that is a high privilege, very small amount of code that manages OS, uh, or let's say checks OS uh, uh, management decisions. And there is a, a, a custom circuitry, which is the uh, memory management unit that does access control. As you see here, the enclaves A and B in hardware are completely isolated, and then they can run their security critical applications. However, the side channel protection here is uh, used, is, is, uh, implemented by using page coloring and page coloring means that you have uh, let's say enclave a in the memory enclave b os and then the part for sm and this uh, uh, pattern is going to repeat and this is of course not very practical because you have chunks of os always in between then there is keystone which i think most of you know this is on, on uh, um, kind of on the flag of risk risk five uh, uh, community and foundation uh, and here we have another architecture. This architecture came after Sanctum. Sanctum used, used the first versions of uh, RISC-V. Here um, you see that you have enclave with the runtime enclave. For example, your, not only your application is running in an enclave, but also that the drivers can be put in an enclave, which is important because drivers are uh, source of lots of, uh, so to say, security vulnerabilities. So they are in the isolated environment. And um, enclaves um, um, are protected by something which is called uh, uh, um, physical uh, protection unit here. This is uh, um, PMP, this is new uh, compared to a Sanctum, um, a special component that provides protection of uh, enclaves. And, um, and if, you, if you look at, uh, for example, one uh, M -M -M PMP region reserved for each, uh, for each uh, active uh, enclave, um, and then uh, the assigns, uh, the, the, the caches or cache ways, as they call it, assigns to processor cores. Another uh, architecture that I would like to uh, show to you is uh, very shortly is, um, Timber 5, which is uh, designed for embedded systems. Uh, it uses, uh, again, application, uh, um, so to say. Um, it, it, of course, isolates sensitive part of an application, and it is, at, as you say, is at the user space level. And for, uh, for protection of, so isolation of memory, it uses tagging. It has no caches because it is for very small systems. It has an memory protection unit and um, it's uh, the memory co uh, access controls are, are controlled by uh, by uh, tag engine and um, cache memory as i said does not exist so if you put them all these uh, three relatively new and known uh, uh, architectures so enclave architectures based on risk 5 that are trying to 
let's say, uh, um, prevents uh, side channel attacks. Um, these, this is a kind of uh, short comparison. So for example, you, they have uh, user level enclaves, then you see that Sanctum does it have it, the others don't have it. User supervisor level enclave, this is where you can put even higher privileged, uh, um, so to say, uh, software in your enclave. In process enclave, that means within a process you can have enclaves. Um, uh, dynamic cache side channel uh, resilience, this is a typical uh, cache side channel or control side channel resilience, which is more about the fault injection, for example, uh, page table fault uh, in, um, in, in injections, or enclave to peripheral binding, which is secure IO. So none of them provide secure IO, or at least they still don't have it inside the thing. So at last, the last slide, I come to Q. So we, we, we looked at all these architectures very uh, thoroughly and uh, wanted to have something because the problem with many of these platforms and clave platforms is that we need to consider applications. This is what people in, at Intel dropped uh, for SGX to my view. You, you cannot just start to design hardware and say, I want to solve all the problems in the world, but I have no idea what for application come on the top. That is, of course, a generic approach. I understand this. But on the other hand, uh, there are many emerging applications, many emerging technologies that you need to take care of. So for that, you need a really clear analysis of what is pragmatic for, for uh, practice. So sometimes you want to have, a, so to say, uh, an enclave at the user level. Sometimes you have to ha you want to have an, an enclave at runtime. Sometimes you want to have an enclave which is bare metal. That means it is running directly on your hardware. So how do you do that? You need to have a very flexible, configurable system. And this is what we tried to do. And this is going to be published at Usenix uh, Security 2021. The paper got lots of uh, praise because actually, unfortunately at security conferences, attack papers are more popular than constructive papers. But here, for example, this security monitor is a very, uh, very small software that manages a lot of things in the system. For example, uh, your uh, uh, configures the so-called filter engine. So why this filter engine? We have a small amount of hardware logic in, on the bus system, and we have a, a security monitor that is anyway in, in all uh, uh, RISC-5 uh, um, in, in the RISC-5 architecture. But we can have an in-process enclave because as you see, security monitor is a part of firmware, but I don't want this uh, the, to protect the whole firmware. I just want to uh, protect the security critical of the firmware. And this is what, where we can put even this security monitor, which is very high privilege, but attackers want to target it as well because then they can get control over the whole system uh, to protect it by means of attack. So, as you see, this filter engine on the bus provide with a very simple logic, provides access control to all peripheral devices. These peripheral devices can be anything. For example, a, a, an AI chip accelerator. And then you can, you can uh, assign directly any enclave directly to the peripheral over a secure uh, channel between the enclave and the peripheral. Note that in all these constructions, we are trying or at least we are doing our best also sgx claims that that operating system is untrusted so operating system could be malicious even in the presence of operation system uh, of, of malicious operating system this uh, channel should work so enclaves can be assigned immediately to the uh, peripherals and this is what the secure io does so this is a comparison with cure we call this our architecture cure because i think it cures some of the problems of other architectures but it is not the last word because then we have hack attack. If anything is, uh, if any bug and any uh, uh, wrong concept is at the lower hardware level and it can be exploited by software, this is where hack attack comes in. And there is a big story ar uh, around it, how you can really uh, um, find these bugs in because the, the state, uh, uh, the, the there is a state explosion in hardware. If you want to check everything in hardware with uh, automatic tools, 
this is a fantasy currently uh, to do that with tools. We need a combination of a lot of techniques to have a pragmatic and uh, effective security. So as a conclusion, I would not go through it, just uh, finish it. Uh, I just put it all together. And what I think as an open challenge is, so I think, I think risk five is, is very important, I think, to for, for uh, research community, but also for industry to, to examine a lot of uh, aspects. Also, all research proposals in the area, uh, area of risk files, they do not ignore side channels. Uh, and as I mentioned, there are a number of sensitive services that need other kind of enclaves. And this is what this system should give them. But what is the challenge is that we still, although we have cash, uh, uh, partitioning, we have a hard cash partitioning. That means you uh, have really for cash lines are, are, are uh, devoted to enclaves. There are still um, more uh, desire for efficiency of, of cash partitioning, which is we are working on that. And that is an upcoming paper. And what is what we are working uh, on it also with other people is enclave architectures for network on chip platforms, because I think network and chip platforms are very useful, and uh, especially for multi-core systems, you cannot put them on the on the simple bus. And uh, how to generate enclaves for this kind of architecture is the next uh, step. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope that thanks so much. You have some questions. <laughs> very nice work. So now I correct myself. You are both in hardware security and a cybersecurity expert. <laughs> Okay, so let's uh, open uh, to the audience. Um, uh, please feel free to send your question either put in chat. I don't know whether you can talk, but I guess you can at least type in your question through the chat channel or through the Q&A uh, channel. We are a bit like uh, over time, so we have around like five minutes-ish uh, for all the questions. But I, uh, I, assume, uh, I assume that the SIGDA uh, and the, the CEDA would uh, release the uh, presentation or, or the, uh, the whole presentation I recorded, they will uh, release from their website. So maybe Iran or Tongyi can uh, tell us more about, because I do get a question, people asking whether they can uh, uh, get access to, this, uh, to these presentations, to the whole panel. Uh, let me let me say it first. Yeah, I think uh, as for the video, we actually recorded, and uh, after the to confirm with all speakers because in, uh, maybe some speaker would not, uh, read some slide or or some partial of the, or the talk, and then we will we will remove it or we will put it on the uh Cida uh, YouTube channel. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's good. Uh, I will do get a one very quick cool question about the QR paper. Ahmad, when you would release the paper? <laughs> the paper will be um, uh, online. Uh, I think the, uh, the camera ready is in one month. So latest in one month, it will be online. Because we are not, uh, we, we don't put it online before the camera ready. Uh, there are some uh, comments of the reviewers that are getting, but uh, there are not so many comments. There are one or two comments. Maybe we even can put it in earlier. Okay, that's good. We do get a technical question. I just don't know uh, who will be the appropriate person, but feel free to chime in uh, for all yeah, the- You can answer it. The proxy uh, computing. So do you see any security issues in approximate computing? So here, can I answer this one? Yeah, sure. So, because I just want to, I mean, show that I'm not just an educator. I'm also trying to do some a little bit research. Okay. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All the are both and you are also not hardware security, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So I'm not just doing hardware security. I'm also doing security on approximate computing. <laughs> so, so, so there are a lot of concerns for security issues in, in approximate computing. And then we're writing a, a big paper, which will be published in the proceeding of IEEE, which we are going to uh, e evaluate what are the vulnerabilities, what are the research directions. And one of the 
key concerns I see from the approximate computing, the security feature is there. So when you do approximate computing, your results in some sense will be er will have errors, will not be accurate. And then it is very hard in some sense to distinguish whether the error is introduced because of a, a proper approximate computing or because of malicious mod modification or by, for example, the uh, manufacturer variations, whether just the, the typical fault or, I mean, errors. So that is one of the biggest concerns. And uh, across the world, so there are a lot of people now working on approximate computing for security or security of approximate computing. And they are working on the security concerns for the approximate hardware, like the approximate address. They are working on how approximate computing can be used, for example, to improve AI security, improve AI's privacy, and a lot of a lot of things there. So it is a very, very promising area. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, let me see if we have uh, another question here is that most of the hardware security paper are related to the defense side, uh, like a microarchitecture attack. What is your perception about offensive security on hardware, which means that from the attack side. So shall I uh, give an answer or anybody else? Yeah, I think all, all of you, uh, maybe Ahmad, you can go start uh, or maybe Mark can go second. So just yeah. Ahmed go first and I'll, I'll, I'll try to add to it. Okay. Um, so offensive uh, security um, has been a, a big uh, discussion, not only for hardware, but also for software in general, uh, on the political level first. Because offensive means you can attack another system, and that system can be uh, a friend or can be a foe. Now, uh, and in Europe, especially in Germany, offensive uh, uh, systems research are not appreciated. That has historical reasons. Uh, in US, offensive uh, uh, systems have been used in military uh, uh, era, but think about uh, the following. Offensive systems are gold mine for security researchers. Why? Because if I can hack into an off offensive system, I can destroy much more. This is a, a very uh, a delicate point. It's exactly like, uh, um, artificial intelligence. This is also a gold mine for, um, for security research because you can hack into that system and run it in a stealthy way. Classification are wrong, you can do denial of service. So whoever does offensive security must do it very, very good. This is why I think it's nonsense. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, I think uh, there is there's the same attitude um, um, by U.S. government um, as well. Um, generally speaking, um, they do not appreciate or even a stronger approve offensive research. Um, where if offensive means um, you're trying to attack into somebody else's system, that's where issue comes from. But if offensive means you do an effort like Ahmed does, uh, where Hackadack or a lot of competitions that we run, um, uh, where a bunch of white hackers get together to try to assess the resilience of your security mechanisms that you put in place, actually is very much welcome. So um, it all depends what you mean by that offensive mechanism. But at the end of the day, we all know defense will not exist if offensive techniques were not in place to find those vulnerabilities. So I second what Ahmed said. Okay. Yeah. So, 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 so can I just add one thing here? Sure. So <clears throat> I agree with both Amara and, uh, and Mark. So offensive secure is very important for hardware security research and not just the hardware. I mean, pretty much all the security come from attacks. And the U.S. government has a very, very strict, I mean, uh, regulations on this. So, for example, I mean, a couple of years ago, we had a project with NIST, and then trying to uh, find some mitigations for GPS spoofing attack. And then when we tried to do this, uh, do, do, do the, I mean, do the experiment, 
the GPS spoofing, you cannot do it in your university lab. You have to have a dedicated facility to do that because otherwise the GPS spoofing may affect some other devices which are close to you that they are using the GPS signals. So it is, it could, could I mean, cause a lot of damages. So if you're just a, for research purpose, so it is welcome, but you have to be very, very careful. I see. Yeah. I, I guess there are some, not just a technical question here. So there's another question coming in is actually for Brandon. So uh, Brandon, can you hear us? Yes, sorry, I mute myself. <laughs> I was talking without the microphone. So the question is about the, you mentioned that in the slide that you've been like sponsoring a lot of events. Uh, the question would be how to approach Synopsis so that uh, they would get support for some other events. Like what will be the channel? Is that yes, uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> Patrick Haspel um, <clears throat> in my group uh, is the director for APOP, means Academic Partnership and University Program. Uh, yeah, definitely he is one channel uh, to reach out. Uh, even at the Synopsis website, there's a link to um, <clears throat> university program academic research, but uh, you're definitely welcome to connect with me or Patrick directly. Uh, we're more than happy to, to, to connect with, uh, you know, <clears throat> with, with the academic um, community. Okay, so this is for more like a sponsorship uh, to events. Is, and is that similar for kind of like a research uh, project wise? Yes, so there's uh, three types of uh, things we engage. One is the sponsorship to the events, right? Uh, and that is to really uh, broader communities, not only, you know, with the uh, specific research area, but anything, anybody that doing electrical engineering could be, uh, you know, really uh, uh, be user of our Synapse tool, IP, and that's why that's why we uh, sponsored this this event as as a branding effort. Now, the engagement with particular research professor, of course, is much more selected. That uh, once we have identified the area of interest, uh, we definitely will will want to be uh, be become a research partner, and that's called APOP, right? The university program have a broader reach uh, and branding with the event sponsorship. And then the AP uh, is called at academic partnership. That's much selected with uh, with you know <clears throat> professors, and uh, these are research oriented activities with grants and you know uh, gift and the, the normal normal uh, or apply you know uh, DODs uh, project together. Uh, and these are all research uh, partnership. So we cover both side, you know research. APUP. The third area I haven't mentioned too much about APUPs. We also cover some of the um, startup company that may be a spun off, spin off out of the uh, professor's research. Uh, and these are the, in the early stage, they may not have a lot of funding to go buy tools and set up the commercial things. And, and Synapse can help you to, in the early stage be able to get the whole process um, in place uh, for the startup to, uh, to uh, and, and future even a partnership uh, together with, uh, with some of the um, Synapse's um, you know, tool ecosystem that including some sort of API access to Synopsis tools. That's very helpful. So I guess we are running out of time. Uh, Iran and Zongyi, do you have anything to add before we conclude the panel? No, uh, thanks, Ian, uh, for, for moderating the, 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 uh, the event and also thanks for all the prominent speakers. I, I feel very, I feel all the talks are very informative and very impressive. I think this event will, will, will share the life for for uh, for all the uh, scholars in our community. Actually, I when I saw the, the attendees, I I saw many familiar names uh, like professors and also people from industry. I really enjoy. So yeah, I actually have no as I mentioned earlier, we will we will read after confirm with all speakers, uh, and then we will we we will release the the video on the YouTube channel. Then I think everyone can can watch the video uh, for all the talks and the questions. Uh, yeah, again. And of course, everyone can send emails to the speakers accordingly. Okay, okay. thank you.
So one last thing, uh, we just got uh, quite a few questions coming in. Let me just quickly answer them uh, to, to uh, free uh, to kind of conclude <laughs> the panel. Uh, the question is actually in one uh, area is about the scaling of the technology regarding the ACE and the hardware security. I think scaling is a, a, an interesting point. Uh, for the ACE, the goal is to scale. Uh, I think the ultimate goal is to fabricate uh, not for the ACE program and not to fabricate a chip, but for the technology is to be prepared for, uh, I think around like a 20 nanometers uh, style or even more advanced technology. Right. Okay, so, okay, so, thanks. So one last question for Ahmad. I think it's very dedicated. Say the channel are most common review they reject many papers can you comment on this <laughs> what again side so channel what repeat the whole question i see a growing prejudice towards unclove enabled application research that's not right? fair so to, I'm I'm not to answer that question and the side the channel are the most common review that reject many papers <laughs> which they claim that oh. The moment no, you have no. a paper, they were saying that you cannot prevent the other channels to reject that paper. So you are one of the review. Yeah. Comment on that. I agree. I agree. Because uh, side channels like blockchains are getting too many. And, uh, <laughs> and as I said, many of these side channels have the same principle. And it is a matter of engineering to go this way or that way. And this is the reason why people are uh, to make it in a very blonde way um, or bold ways. Um, yeah, people are sick of uh, 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 seeing uh, too many side channel attacks. But I think if you have an interesting uh, attack, let's say some uh, architecture that is open, like RISC V architecture, claims to, to have side channel protection and you break into it, like for example, let's say one of these, let's say I take RR design. Cure. You take Cure when it is published and you ask us to give you code. We don't give you the code. You will uh, <laughs> make the code yourself and then you break into it and then you see, hey, I have a paper. Because if you attack SGX for the, uh, I don't, the end, time, that is not going to be very exciting. That's the reason. So I do not really condemn what uh, PC members do. I know that the uh, security community is very harsh with reviews. I understand it happens to my group as well, but indeed people think that there are enough sites. Okay, okay, thanks. So uh, we are really like uh, uh, run out of time. So thanks for attending the panel. Uh, feel free to ask the panelists questions and feel free to contact Iran or Zongyi for any organizing uh, uh, or the release of the videos. So yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. I just want to thank you for the uh, for the moderation and uh, it's also good to see friends again. During this <laughs> time. Thank you. Okay. okay.